a lie that nobody can tell. Every kid on the block talks in riddles and prose. Then we dance till we drop, drop, drop. Ooh, drop. Hey, hey. The most significant news coming out of Russia this month was the death of the Russian opposition leader, anti-corruption activist, and political prisoner, Alexei Navalny. Long-time viewers will likely know that we've been covering this guy since 2020. But for those hearing about him for the first time, prepare to wonder how this guy could even walk with balls so enormous. Alexei Navalny first broke into the limelight in 2013, running for the mayor of Moscow, only to be beaten by Sergei Soybyanin, a Putin appointee. In 2018, Navalny would run for president against Putin himself, but was disqualified due to past criminal convictions. It should be noted that these crimes were widely considered entirely fabricated to prevent him from running. Continuing his campaign against Putin, Alexei Navalny would be poisoned by the Russian state with a Novichok nerve agent in 2020. Footage of him groaning on a flight would later be referenced by Navalny after his recovery, stating that he was not doing so because of the pain, but because he knew he was dying. Luckily, for him, he was evacuated to Berlin, where he would be put in a medically induced coma for 18 days. At this point, you might expect Mr. Navalny to put an end to his anti-corruption campaign in Russia, but he would instead do the ballsiest thing imaginable. With the help of investigative journalist group Bellingcat, Navalny's poisoners were tracked down. And this is where Navalny himself had a brilliant idea. Pretending to be the aide to a high-ranking FSB official, Navalny would ring the agents who tried to kill him, and would start grilling them over why their assassination failed. Not only did he manage to extract confessions for the attempt on his life, but one of the assassins admitted that the poison was applied in his underwear. Of course, this would make sense, as at this stage, Navalny was widely known to have the biggest balls in Russia. In January 2021, only five months after being in a coma, Navalny would once again demonstrate his insane level of bravery, as he would board a plane and willingly go back to Russia. Knowing he would be arrested, Navalny believed that by returning to Russia, he would inspire others to set aside their fears and create a path for Russia to be a fundamentally better place. Upon landing, Navalny would immediately be arrested by Russian authorities, on the charge of breaking the terms of his probation by leaving Russia. As he had only left Russia because he was being poisoned by the government, Navalny was literally arrested for not dying as intended. Mr. Navalny would later be sentenced for whatever bullshit the Russian court system could think up at the time. While Navalny himself would tweet out one of the hardest lines from the TV show The Wire, you only do two days. That's the day you go in and the day you come out. Needless to say, Alexei's time in a Russian prison was fucking miserable. He would be constantly woken up to deprive him of sleep. He would suffer serious back pain and lose all feeling in his hands. He would also be consistently denied medical treatment and later become seriously malnourished. Navalny would later be transferred to the IK-3 penal colony, about the worst place you could find yourself within Russian borders. Inmates have reported being forced to stand without coats in minus 20 degree weather in the winter and stand shirtless in mosquito swarms in the summer. Navalny's assigned cellmates were some of the most tortured people in Russia, with some believing they were possessed by demons, another who had tuberculosis, and one more who was said to scream 17 hours a day. The cells are incredibly cramped, the toilets themselves are shared, and are described as nothing more than a hole in the ground. On the 16th of February 2024, Alexei Navalny was declared dead by the Federal Penitentiary Service after losing consciousness after going for a walk. 
The day before his death, Navalny had appeared to be in good health while appearing at a court hearing via video link, even making jokes, making his sudden death really fucking suspicious. Regardless of whether it was an outright assassination, there is no reasonable doubt that Navalny was killed by the Russian government for his activism and opposition to Vladimir Putin. As Russian writer Boris Akunin would state shortly after his death, there is nothing more the dictator can do to Navalny. Navalny is dead and has become immortal. Before returning to Russia in 2021, the opposition leader would film the now Oscar-winning documentary named after himself, and in the film's final sequence, he would urge his fellow Russians not to give up in the event of his death, stating that, this means that we are unusually strong at this moment, since they decided to kill me. On Valentine's Day, just two days before his death, Navalny would write a final letter to his wife, reading, Baby, everything is like a song with you. Between us there are cities, the takeoff lights of airfields, blue snowstorms, and thousands of kilometers. But I feel that you are near every second, and I love you more and more. Alexei Navalny was 47 when he died. 2024 is set to be a year of elections, and so far, they've never failed to make for great stories. Pakistan's general election was held at the start of the second week of February, and to say it was controversial would be quite an understatement. As always, a big chunk of this story will be the necessary context, so strap yourselves in. In 2018, former cricket star Imran Khan was elected as Prime Minister, representing his own party, the PTI, which he founded in 1996. Over his first term, Khan did his best to balance the budget and commit to a number of renewable energy goals. But like most governments during this period, the universe threw an enormous COVID-19-shaped wrench into his time in office. Pakistan's economy was about to be hit hard by the pandemic and by 2021, over 20 million people were left unemployed. On the 8th of March 2022, Khan's opposition party submitted a vote of no confidence motion against the Prime Minister, citing his government's poor social and economic performance during his term. Critics of the move disapproved of the motion, stating that Pakistani opposition leaders copied it from Star Wars Episode 1, The Phantom Menace, while Imran Khan himself had much more serious allegations. Khan himself would claim that his ousting was orchestrated by the United States after they were unhappy with his visit to Russia, a visit which would take place only hours into the invasion of Ukraine. Allegedly, a high-ranking US official told Pakistan to get rid of Khan or face isolation by the US and Europe. But from how little this was reported from reputable news sources, it's difficult to know whether this actually happened. Quite unfortunately for us at the Swag News team, we're absolutely out of our depth to say either way. What we can say is that Imran Khan was out, but this didn't diminish his huge popularity within the nation of Pakistan. On November 3rd, 2022, as he was leading a march through the city of Wazirabad, Khan was shot in the leg in an attempted assassination. Four months later, he would accuse a high-ranking member of the military of trying to have him assassinated. And on the following day, he would be arrested. The accused man in question was Major General Faisal Nazir, who also happens to be Pakistan's spy master. Fast forward to February 1st of this year, Imran Khan and his wife would be sentenced to 14 years for illegally leaking state secrets and receiving gifts. The trial, as you might imagine, was accused of being a politically motivated shitshow by Khan and his supporters. Firstly, the verdict was seen to be rushed, and the presiding judge had denied Khan's lawyer's request to cross-examine witnesses in the trial. Secondly, Khan's lawyers were not even present when the sentence was given. On top of this, part of Khan's sentence stipulated that he wasn't allowed to hold public office for 10 years. Convenient timing considering the election was only a week away. With Imran Khan out of the picture, the election victory of the Pakistan Muslim League's Nawaz Sharif was seen to be a foregone conclusion. Until it wasn't. Despite PTI's 27-year leader no longer being able to hold office, its members collectively said, fuck it, we ball. Although no longer being allowed to stand as PTI candidates, nothing said his previous party members couldn't all stand as independents. And stand as independents they did. In a result that stunned the nation, this independent vote swept the election. Meaning although he was in prison, Imran Khan was still arguably the most powerful man in all of Pakistan. An important part of Pakistani politics we've neglected to mention until now is that much like other nations like Turkey or Thailand, Pakistan is more or less a pretend democracy. 
Since its inception in 1947, no prime minister has ever been elected without the backing of the nation's military, a faction that holds a huge amount of power within the country. The military controls the media, they also decide who gets to travel in and out of the country, and they're not above forcefully throwing out a leader they don't particularly like. Election day itself was also pretty fucking dodgy, with internet and mobile services being shut off nationwide just 10 minutes before polls opened. This is on top of widespread allegations allegations of ballot stuffing, and even reports of ballot boxes being picked up and walked out of polling centers. As of time of writing, coalitions are still being formed to gain enough seats to form a government, and it appears as if the Pakistan Muslim League and the Pakistan People's Party, two dynastic parties with long entrenched ties to the military, are set to take over. This is despite a senior Pakistani official turning himself in a week after the election after he quote, converted the losers into winners, reversing margins of 70,000 votes in 13 National Assembly seats. An unfortunate reality of our monthly format is that for the time it takes to edit everything together, stories tend to shift and change. Meaning that by the time you're watching this, leadership within Pakistan may have already been finalized. What we can say for sure, however, is that the democratic process within Pakistan is obviously and quite unfortunately still very flawed. We can only hope that the true will of the people can be properly exercised, regardless of what that might be. A story which has thrown up its fair share of headlines this month has been the US-Mexico border, a topic which has been at the forefront of US politics for as long as we've covered the news. The past few months have seen a record number of people claiming asylum over the southern border, figures that would have been unheard of only a few years ago. Between 2013 and 2019, the average monthly encounters for Border Patrol agents sat at around 39,000 per month. Since the start of 2020, however, around when Joe Biden took office, cases have grown as high as 300 100,000 as of December last year. This has created a humanitarian crisis which has left countless people with nowhere to go, and local level governments who are unable to handle such an influx of people. According to a recent YouGov poll, the border issue is the second most important problem facing the US behind inflation, which will likely make it a prime focal point going into the upcoming US election. Republicans have repeatedly accused Discoverer of Fire and US President Joe Biden and his Secretary of Homeland Security Alejandro Mayor of failing to prevent the record number of crossings, both legal and illegal, at the border. As Republicans currently only control the House of Representatives, they are unable to directly affect the administration's immigration policy, only able to use it as a bargaining tool by holding up the things that the Biden administration wants to get done. Earlier in the month, the White House struck a deal with House Republicans to increase security and control at the border, in exchange for further military aid for Israel and Ukraine. The deal gave the government power to close the border when asylum seeker numbers reach 5,000 in one month, as well as broadly expanding the ability to deport immigrants from the country. The deal was supported by Biden and most Democrats in Congress. At the last minute, however, former President Donald Trump claimed the deal was not tough enough. This would lead to Republicans to pull out one at a time, with the deal eventually stalling out entirely. At roughly the same time, Republicans in the House introduced articles of impeachment against Secretary Mayorkas. Despite Democratic lawmakers insisting that the impeachment is merely a political stunt, the House passed the impeachment vote on its second try by the narrowest possible margin, a vote of 214 to 213. This makes Mayorkas the first cabinet secretary to be impeached since the Secretary of War William Belknap in 1876. As with any impeachment, however, this does not mean that Mayorkas is immediately removed from his office. The impeachment would first have to get through the much more apathetic Senate, which at this stage seems less likely than Titanfall 3 being announced before this video goes live. As for what to do about the border, that question in itself could be enough to justify a whole video on its own. Republicans would argue that Joe Biden's reversal of many of Trump's policies led to such an influx of refugees across the border, while Democrats would argue that Trump's dismissal of this month's border deal is merely a cynical attempt to exacerbate the issue before November's elections. We also can't discount why a huge number of people are coming into the United States in the first place. With political instability in Haiti, violence in Ecuador, 
a crackdown in Nicaragua, an invasion of Ukraine, and a dickhead government in China, all fueling an influx of refugees. On top of this, a path to legal immigration for many seeking asylum is effectively unfeasible, with the waiting list for some stretching more than two decades. On average, immigration judges in the US have a backlog of four and a half thousand cases, meaning for those seeking asylum in the United States, it's cheaper and infinitely easier to just take their chances through the desert. Most people within the US can agree that the immigration systems put in place are fundamentally broken. But the way in which it might be fixed will still remain a contentious issue, long past November's election. Near the start of February, the Central American nation of El Salvador held its 2024 general election. Unlike our usual election coverage, we won't be talking about the policies of each party, because in this particular instance, we wouldn't want to waste your time. This is because the winner and incumbent president, Nayib Bukile, won by such an enormous margin that we'd rather talk about how on earth such a person could score such a high number of votes without outright rigging the election. Nayib Bukile isn't your average presidential candidate. First starting his political career in 2012, the then 30-year-old Bukile was voted mayor of the small municipality of Nuevo Cuscatlan. Over his three-year term, Bukile would vastly improve illiteracy and education, see murder rates plummet, open both a medical clinic and a library, and provide residents with drinking water 24 hours a day. Following his success in a town of less than 10,000 people, Nayib Bukile would run for mayor of the nation's capital, San Salvador, in 2015. Taking a similar approach, the millennial mayor would build a new library, invest in infrastructure and breathe new life into the shopping markets, quickly gaining the image of the guy who gets shit done. By 2019, the young mayor was in a prime position to take a shot at the presidency. After getting kicked out of his own party and starting his own, Bikile would leverage his previous success to win the 2019 presidency. Not only did he do this as a third-party candidate in a two-party system, but he did so with 53% of the vote, meaning a runoff election wasn't even necessary. Gaining so much traction as the guy who got shit done, Nayib Bukile was about to tackle arguably the nation's biggest problem plaguing the country, gang violence and organized crime. In his seven-phase territorial control plan, Bukile would start an aggressive crackdown on gang activity within the nation, which would eventually lead to the 2020 Salvadorian political crisis. After failing to convince the two major political parties to grant him a $109 million loan, Bukile would invoke Article 167 of the Constitution. This allows the president to call an emergency legislative assembly if the interests of the nation demand it. Here's where things get interesting. Assuming his loan plan met these requirements, it would be the constitutional duty of lawmakers to attend, even when most of them eventually didn't. Bikile would then remind the same lawmakers of Article 87, which states that citizens of El Salvador have a right to mount an insurrection should lawmakers fail to do their job. Bikile was legitimately ready to overthrow the government. The still green president wouldn't have to do this, however, as in 2021 he would gain a decisive majority in the Legislative Assembly, meaning the only thing standing between between him and the ability to do pretty much anything he wanted was the Supreme Court. As it turned out, having a majority in the assembly meant that he could simply vote them out and fill its members with people who were aligned with his policies. Now effectively controlling all three branches of government, Bikile whipped out the legislative sledgehammer and started swinging. Perhaps the biggest event of Bikile's first term in office started on the 26th of March 2022, when the nation recorded 62 murders in a single day, the highest in 30 years years. Already known as having one of the highest murder rates in the world, El Salvador had more murders per capita than every other country which wasn't actively in a war zone. El Salvador was at one point 20 times deadlier than the United States and 90 times deadlier than the UK. But 62 murders a day was still a step too far. Now wielding basically unlimited power, the president would declare a 30-day state of emergency, which suspended a handful of constitutional and civil liberties, and gave the police wide-sweeping power to arrest gang members. Police could now arrest people without an explanation. Those arrested didn't have the right to legal counsel and those taken by police could be in custody for a whole 15 days before seeing a judge. Police would simply show up to a gang stronghold and start arresting known gang members and anyone who looked like they were part of a gang. This would lead to a lot of arbitrary arrests as arresting people became incredibly easy and police quotas gave them every reason to take in large batches of people. 
Evidence was no longer necessary. Nearly two years later, at the start of 2023, with the state emergency still being in effect, police had now arrested 75,000 people in the crackdown. In the span of just a few years, El Salvador went from having over 100 murders per 100,000 inhabitants in 2015 to just under 2.5 murders per 100,000 inhabitants in 2023. As you might imagine, however, its rate of incarceration also skyrocketed to over 1,000 people per 100,000 behind bars, nearly doubling the already incredibly high rates of the United States. 2% of El Salvador's adult population is currently being detained. To house all of these people, the nation saw the construction of the nation's terrorism confinement center, a prison which was built at a blazingly fast pace and now stands as the largest in the world, being able to house 40,000 inmates. There are more people in this prison alone than the entire nation of Liechtenstein. Although pulling off the impossible, Bekele's policies are often criticized by critics as being heavy-handed and outright authoritarian. Thousands of innocent people were detained within the nation's judicial system. Bekele himself has essentially unchecked power, and many rights within the nation have long been suspended. Internationally, it's hard to find reporters or human rights groups that are supportive of Bekele, as his first term in office has severely degraded democratic systems within the country. In fact, according to the nation's constitution, Bekele wasn't even allowed to run for a second term. But as arguably the most popular leader in the world with unchecked power, no one was about to stop him. The 2024 presidential election saw Nayib Bukele win with over 10 times the votes as his closest opposition, meaning despite his ends justify the means style of government, he still remains as popular as ever. Nayib Bukele is such an interesting figure, because on paper the man is essentially a dictator, but he's a democratically elected dictator who also became so popular within El Salvador that it's genuinely difficult to find citizens who don't like the guy. For any viewers who happen to be watching from El Salvador, we'd love to hear your opinion of Bekele in the comments, as from an international perspective, he's a really hard person to cover. In the meantime, it seems as if Nayib Bekele will remain as president for another five years within El Salvador. And whether he remains as popular, further degrades democratic systems, or even tries to stay in power for a third term is still yet to be seen. The difficulty of covering a guy like Bekele is you have a right-leaning headline calling him the coolest dictator in the world, while a source from the left covers it as this is going to give you a very different impression to another source from the left saying he's running an autocratic regime. With the help of our sponsor, Ground News, we can take an in-depth look at the story. It's a website and app created to give readers a transparent way to read the news. With access to over 50,000 news sources across the political spectrum, it allows you to compare pair headlines and see where the bias leans per article. If we go back to the story, we can see that from the over 200 stories covering the election, the coverage is a pretty even split across the political spectrum as seen on the bias distribution chart. It's important to see how both sides cover the same story to get the full picture on a story. To get a short summary of how each side covers a story, the bias insights feature really does the trick. Ground News is the perfect place to start learning about any current news topic, because it makes learning about it fast, simple, and it does so without running the risk of having blind spots in your knowledge. The best part of all is that by using our link in the description, users can get the Vantage plan for 30% off, which is about $6 a month. This gives you unlimited access to every single feature Ground News has to offer. We can only provide news once a month, so in the meantime, Ground News really is the place to be. Meanwhile, a man in Atlanta was charged a 30 grand water bill without being connected to the water line. Conspiracy theorists brand Taylor Swift a Pentagon asset, and a Florida police officer confuses a falling acorn for gunfire. In other news from the land of Uncle Sam, it seems that no American president in the last eight years has been able to handle classified government documents appropriately whatsoever. On the 8th of February, a special counsel issued a 345-page report detailing Joe Biden's ending days as vice president and how he, quote, willfully retained and disclosed classified materials after his vice presidency when he was a private citizen. The report, led by former United States Attorney Robert Hur, was made up of 160 
173 interviews, 147 witnesses, and over 7 million documents from the past 40 years of Biden's political career. The findings from that report showed that Joe Biden did in fact illegally keep documents that were marked classified, which included, but were not limited to, notes pertaining to foreign military policy in Afghanistan, personal documents from the president's daily briefs, handmade notes from the National Security Council meetings, and lastly, additional reference material produced from the previously listed documents that were then given to the ghostwriter of his memoir, Promise Me Dad. Despite the special counsel's report finding serious risks to national security and breaches of law, President Biden will not be facing any criminal charges for his past actions, with the counsel stating that, quote, the evidence does not establish Mr. Biden's guilt beyond a reasonable doubt. The report detailed that President Biden's past actions could have been done by mistake or were done without ill intent, citing his declining cognitive function and poor memory as reasons they could not prove willful retention beyond a reasonable doubt. In case you thought you might not have heard that correctly, the current President of the United States at the time of writing is on record for not having to face criminal charges because he was stated to be mentally incompetent. We could not make that shit up if we tried. This is in stark contrast to the previous United States President Donald Trump, who is dealing with the same problem relating to classified documents. Trump is instead facing criminal charges in the form of 32 counts of willful retention of national defense information, which violates the Espionage Act, six felony counts of obstruction-related crimes, and two felony counts of false statements. The difference between the two presidents from the eyes of the US government is that although guilty of being a very confused old man, Biden did his best to assist lawmakers in the process of his special counsel investigation. The implication of his merits to run the most powerful country in history are a question for another time. Mr. Trump, on the other hand, was quite famously not nearly as cooperative, leading to a string of events which would eventually have his house raided in 2022. In what might be a strange turn of events, Biden's investigation may also be the first time Democratic lawmakers have argued that Trump is mentally competent. US politics really is like getting a visit to a zoo. On this note, the US presidential election is fast approaching and is set to be held on the 5th of November. We fully intend to make a dedicated video breaking down the two candidates closer to the big day, one which we can hopefully shed light on their plans for the country with as little bias as possible. Until then, it seems as if the American people will just have to get used to having one of these guys in charge until the next election in 2028. On the 1st of February, farmers in the European Union protested outside the EU Parliament building in Brussels in response to the summit meeting looking to provide more funding to Ukraine. Thousands of tractors gathered to block the urban roadways, with some protesters sparking fires and occupying outside government buildings, while others held up signs in active opposition. Although the summit wasn't specifically addressing EU farming policy, Russia's invasion of Ukraine has made the lives of European farmers harder than it already was. But we'll circle back to that in a moment moment. As early as 2021, farmers all across the world have been protesting against government policies that handicap farmers' livelihoods and businesses. These protests were predominantly in the EU last year, as well as in India, South and Central America, and in certain parts of Africa, showcasing the growing trend of what farmers believe is inadequate agricultural lawmaking. Common sentiments surrounding worldwide farming inequality includes unfair government policies, extreme fluctuation in the price of produce, delayed compensation or subsidy programs in place, and other political and cultural factors depending on the country. The situation in the EU has been brewing as early as November 2023, when German government authorities announced that they would be making significant cuts to agricultural subsidies for German farmers, pushing the farmers to protest throughout the city. Fast forward to now, and a multitude of countries are demonstrating across their cities after witnessing the protests outside the EU Parliament building. Tractors have become a common uniting factor for those protests and have acted as roadblocks within the city streets of Italy, Spain, Poland, Belgium, Germany, France and the Netherlands, with farmers showing solidarity for better agricultural support. To farmers within the EU, it's not hard to see why they've been so up in arms, as these guys have been taking shit from every direction you could imagine. Firstly, there's the war over Ukraine, which among other things has generally made farming a lot more expensive. Fertilizer, energy, and transportation costs have all increased since Russia decided to roll tanks over the border. The base price farmers have received for their products has also dropped an average of 9% 
percent between the third quarter of 2022 and the same time last year. On top of this, the EU has also waived quotas and duties for Ukrainian farmers following the start of the war, which has in turn flooded the EU with cheap produce and driven down prices. Another pain point is the import of produce from South America, which uses pesticides banned within the EU, creating what farmers see as an unfair playing field. Another point of contention is the EU's commitment to be carbon neutral by 2050, a noble goal which has disproportionately impacted farmers. Part of the EU's legislation has involved plans to cut fertilizer use by 20%, halve pesticides and devote more land to non-agricultural use. Quite tragically, the farming sector will also be one of the hardest hit by climate change already, with extreme weather events like droughts, floods and heat waves being more intense and more frequent. As election season rounds the corner for many Europeans this year, some countries have made concessions in support of farmers, with the French government already making headway on providing new measures to appease protesters. At the time of writing, demonstrations are still very much ongoing, with every day shaping up to be a standstill between farmers and politicians, two groups which whether they'd like to admit it or not, can't live without the other. Viewers are free to subscribe for when we inevitably turn into a farm drama channel. This month now marks two years since Russia's invasion of Ukraine, showing a very different war from the opening months of 2022. Unlike those opening months where the front line would shift rapidly and often, the conflict has become much more static, with neither side having the ability to make major gains over the other. With this said, Ukraine saw a leadership change within its military this month, seeing President Zelensky name Colonel General Alexander Sierski as the new leader of Ukraine's ground forces. Sierski has long been a prominent figure within Ukraine, organizing the defense of the capital in the opening days of the war, and later being bestowed with the Hero of Ukraine Award, the country's highest honor. He is also famous for orchestrating the Kharkiv counteroffensive, the most significant Ukrainian victory in the war, as well as leading the defense of Bakhmut, a particularly deadly operation designed to tie up Russian troops in the strategically insignificant salt mining town. Born in the Soviet Union and attending the Moscow Higher Military Command School, observers have described his leadership as a blend between the hierarchical Soviet doctrine and the more flexible NATO style. New leadership won't be enough to win the war on its own, however, as Ukraine's allies have left the country seriously undersupplied when compared to its less than friendly eastern neighbor. European arms deliveries have been delayed, while the United States has had its latest $60 billion aid package fall through within the House of Representatives. As we've covered in another story this month, Republican lawmakers have blocked the package, concerned that not enough money is being allocated to the border crisis. Perhaps quite strangely, Vladimir Putin himself also had the same concerns, as when asked this month in an interview about the US funds to Ukraine, he would state, quote, Do the United States need this? What for? Thousands of miles away from your national territory, don't you have anything better to do? You've issues on the border, issues with migration, issues with the national debt. You have nothing better to do, so you should fight in Ukraine? CIA Director William Burns would give his own opinion on the funding to Ukraine, stating that the US sends less than 5% of its defense budget to Ukraine, calling it, quote, a relatively modest investment with significant geopolitical returns. He argues that if an opportunity for negotiations to end the war were to arise, US supplied arms would allow Ukraine to be in a much stronger bargaining position. He would also go on to say, quote, for the United States to walk away from the conflict at this crucial moment and cut off support to Ukraine would be an own goal of historic proportions. In this sense, the war over Ukraine has very much been a conflict which has come to represent much more than the fate of the Eastern European nation. On one hand, Putin's reputation and competency as a leader is tied up in the success of his imperial ambitions. This means that although he's effectively fucked the country economically for decades to come, he cannot afford to lose the war for his own sake. On the other hand, the United States has long been seen as the sheriff of the world, and its ability to project power and protect allies has seen many regions live in relative peace. If the United States is seen as an unreliable ally, this could have far-reaching ramifications all around the globe. All of a sudden, the safety of a long list of other countries under the protection of the United States comes into question, which might embolden other nations with a mind for expansion. The reality is that the US really doesn't get to choose to not support Ukraine, because its position as a superpower demands it either protects its allies or accept a world where they no longer have a seat at the head of the table. As strange as it sounds, this kind of aid is the subscription cost of being a superpower. 
This isn't to say Ukraine isn't doing its best despite being undersupplied, with this month seeing the Ukrainian Air Force shooting down a Russian A-50 military spy plane, the second such downing in just over a month. Although this might not seem significant, these planes are seen as key assets for Russian forces, serving as command centers in the sky. Not only this, but they're also really hard to replace, with Russia having less than 10 in its entire fleet. In another small victory, Ukraine's military was also able to use naval drones to sink a Russian landing ship in the Black Sea, a vessel which can carry a total of 87 crew members. The sinking marks roughly 80 Russian ships sunk since the start of the war, a fact made more impressive considering Ukraine barely has a navy at all. A navy might not matter, however, as this month saw President Zelensky order a whole new branch of the military to be created, a branch specifically for drones. As anyone closely following the conflict will tell you, Ukraine has become a testing ground for a new age of drone warfare. Drones are difficult to detect and can be hilariously cheap, meaning a teenager with a few hundred bucks can now take out millions in military hardware sitting well behind the front line. Drones themselves have also become something of a domestic industry within the nation, with President Zelensky pledging that Ukraine would produce a million drones in 2024. Military academics the world over are watching Ukraine very closely, as this new kind of conventional warfare will likely change how wars will be fought long into the future. The war between Israel and Hamas is now inching closer to the five-month milestone, and much has changed since it started on the 7th of October. The intensity of fighting has appeared to have simmered down within Gaza as Israel prepares to take the southern city of Rafah. Although at the start of the year, Israel's defense force stated that it had dismantled the Hamas military framework in northern Gaza, it later admitted that some Hamas elements had begun to rebuild their armies. Once again talking to our IDF contact who saw fighting within Gaza, he told us that his division had started the process of training for a new northern front, more specifically a war with Hezbollah, a Hamas-aligned militant group based in Lebanon. Although he states that this kind of training is merely in the event that Hezbollah took more of an active role in the conflict, it demonstrates a new direction the war may be headed. Since the early days of the war, Iranian-backed Houthi rebels have been attacking shipping lanes in the Red Sea, which would culminate in the US striking back with 130 Tomahawk cruise missiles last month. At this stage, it wouldn't be hard to argue that this conflict, or at least a significant dimension of it, has shifted into a weird proxy war between the US and Iran. The United States has obviously supplied an abundance of support to Israel, including these indirect military strikes, and Iran has been arming pretty much anyone who has any level of beef with either Israel or the United States. The US and Iran have long been at odds with each other a rivalry that intensified following the 1979 Iranian Revolution and the toppling of a regime initially installed by the CIA. The relationship was then strained further by a US embargo on the nation since 1995, restrictions which were temporarily lifted in 2015 with the Iran nuclear deal, but quickly reversed in 2018 with the Trump administration's maximum pressure campaign. This would later be followed by the US assassinating Iranian General Qasem Soleimani at the start of 2020, which to to put it lightly, did not go down well. The biggest uniting factor between the two nations in recent times has been its hatred of ISIS, which is why the United States warned the Iranian government prior to the terror attack in early January, which killed 95 people. Needless to say, the relationship between Iran and the US is complicated, and it's gotten even more complicated since the start of the year. In terms of the Middle East, it seems Iran has nearly as many enemies as the US. From the minute the calendar hit 2024, Iran supplied Houthi rebels to attack commercial shipping, conducted missile strikes against ISIS in Iraq and Syria, and even bombarded an Iranian-backed group in Pakistan, for reasons we don't have time to explain. Perhaps the most significant strike was too late into last month for us to cover, which occurred on the 28th of January on a US outpost in Jordan. The attack saw an Iranian drone, which was confused for a US drone, slip past US defenses and go on to kill three US troops and injure 47 others. Despite Iranian-backed groups previously launching over 160 rocket attacks against US or US allied forces since the start of the Israel-Hamas conflict, this marks the first time US troops had been killed. 
Iran would go on to deny any involvement in the attack, however it would later be traced to a Shia militia group supported by Iran. I guess this is why we call them proxy wars. Although unusually letting attacks slide within the region, the United States tends to respond much more forcefully when casualties are involved, going on to strike more than 95 targets within Syria and Iraq. When professional dodo hunter and current US President Joe Biden was questioned on whether he holds Iran responsible for the attack in Jordan, he would respond, I do hold them responsible, in the sense that they're supplying weapons to the people who did it. To return to the center of the conflict, after that admittedly long side story, the reason Israel is so worried about Hezbollah is because for the most part, they make Hamas look like absolute chumps. Unlike Hamas, Hezbollah has a legitimate medium-sized army, and the largest army in the world by a non-state actor. Their self-reported numbers are as many as 100,000 trained fighters, but it's hard to know the exact figures. Once again, Hezbollah is in large part funded by Iran, and its forces are even trained by Iran's Islamic Revolutionary Guard Corps, generally making them more formidable than Hamas. When we asked our IDF contact about the difference between the groups, the now promoted Sergeant Daniel had this to say. Hezbollah is not Hamas. They're a much more real army, for lack of a better word. They have better equipment, training, and manpower. They have tanks, state-of-the-art rockets and drones. In short, it would be a much more conventional kind of war, as opposed to the guerrilla warfare we see in Gaza. There would be much more losses, on both the military and civilian sides. As for Hezbollah's intentions, the group's 1985 manifesto, stated by Mario, says, Our struggle will end only when this entity is obliterated. But Luigi says, line up in a row, because Israel's gotta go. Although a much more capable military compared to Hamas, Hezbollah's chances of defeating Israel in conventional warfare is about as close to zero as you can get, as although a formidable force, it's still outmatched and outclassed in pretty much every conceivable metric. The conflict would likely be much more destructive, and may even draw in other players from within the Middle East, but a US-backed Israel would still have to throw pretty hard to not come out on top. To finally loop back around to Gaza, Benjamin Netanyahu has remained steadfast in Israel's plan to move into Rafah, despite a long list of critics. Most notably, even the United States. Israel's closest ally has more or less told them to chill out. Rafah is a city on the Egyptian border, which is usually home to around 170,000 people. But due to this most recent conflict, it is now sheltering one and a half million Palestinians, most of which are struggling to meet their basic needs. Although Netanyahu insists that the town must be taken to wipe out the last Hamas stronghold, it would stand to reason that firing weapons anywhere near an area so crowded would result in a huge number of civilian casualties. On the home front, Benjamin Netanyahu has not remained a popular leader among Israeli citizens, with a poll earlier this year finding that only 15% of Israelis want him to remain following the war. Additionally, 69% stated that elections should be held as soon as the war comes to an end. We of course asked Sergeant Daniel about Israeli sentiment towards Netanyahu. The vast majority of citizens are so sick and tired of Bibi and want him gone. There's a really, really small minority that supports him these days, and they will always support him no matter what. Even quite far-right people can't stand him anymore. Indeed, his approval plummeted even more. People are tired of his decisions, lies, empty promises, and constant negative interference with the war. On a personal level, he would also add, quote, The rest of his government are just as bad, if not worse. Minister of Interior Security, Itamar ben Gavir, is a fascistic, racist, homophobic, and all of the rest of the words, lunatic. Pretty much all of Bibi's government are selfish, incompetent, borderline cartoonishly evil fools. Once again, it's very likely that we've missed events in our coverage that didn't make our cutoff date for writing. With this in mind, viewers are free to give themselves an absolute headache from other sources in their own time. Something something ground news. As always, here's the current death toll for the conflict as of the latest available figures. With the news over, it's once again announcement time, and if you haven't already, feel free to check out our second channel, Sir Swag Academy. Skipty has been hard at work editing like a goblin on crack, and we believe it when we say we're cooking up some spicy stuff which will be ready real soon. We recently held a team-wide civilization stream to celebrate hitting 20,000 subscribers, and although Swag wrote this script before its conclusion, he'd like to congratulate himself for his inevitable glorious victory. Well done, Swag. Moving on, we'd once again like to thank the 
the best people on planet Earth, our Patreon supporters. Not only have they allowed us to keep this series going for five straight years without missing an episode, but they've allowed us to practice and grow in ways we never think were possible. If you don't think your support helps, I dare you to go back and watch this series from when we first started, because it's almost embarrassing how much better we've become. All supporters will also get their name in the end credits, which means when some high school student is forced to watch these a hundred years from now, they'll have guys like Comfy Hat and Christopher Cock and Balls to thank. A link to support us will be down below, but as always, on behalf of the entire team, we'd like to wish everyone a happy March of 2024.